Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to what will be my new shop. If you uh, didn't already hear, we did move. We got a new house and as part of that, I'll be converting this three car garage into my new shop, which is super exciting. This is a little bigger than what I'm currently in. My current shop is 20 by 20. It's a two car garage. This is a three car. It's 20 deep and a little over 32 wide. So it is 648 square feet. So like 60% more space. <laughs> There's also more headroom too, so this is going to be super nice. So in this first video, I'm going to take you along as I kind of start the conversion process. We're going to make this a much nicer, bright place to work. So let me show you what this place looked like before I got started. I'm starting off by getting the floor painted. The concrete takes some heavy prep work and getting the paint down will give it plenty of time to cure and reach full durability before we need to be moving things around in here. The third stall is where the previous owner had parked their tractor, which has leaked quite a bit over the years. I'll start the prep process by spot treating the heavily stained areas in the garage with degreaser. I actually did this twice. I had already spot treated this area the night before. Next up is washing the entire floor. I use my pressure washer and some more degreaser. This will further remove any oils from the surface and clean off any dirt. A light squeegee action and I can move on. And next is going to be etching. I wasn't sure how necessary or effective this would be since the concrete was previously sealed, but it's a pretty inexpensive and quick step. I dissolve the etch in some warm water and spread it over the surface with a watering can. Then I'll work the surface with an acid scrub brush and allow the etch to sit on the surface for about 15 minutes. Last, I can give the entire floor one last rinse with a hose. Yes, I own a hose, and I'll squeegee the floor and allow it to dry overnight before starting to paint. I'm using a two part off the shelf garage floor paint. This one happens to be Rust-Oleum's Epoxy Shield. Here's a tip which my dad taught me. Anytime you buy paint, have the paint department shake the can for you. He always said that you have no idea how long that can's been sitting on the shelf, and that'll save you a lot of stirring. And as you can see, I was in a rush this time and did not stop by the paint counter, so now I have a lot of stirring and mixing to do. I'll start with a brush cutting in around the perimeter of the garage and then roll in the field. In my previous shop, I also painted the floors but I use a water-based two-part garage floor paint. This time I'm using a solvent-based product. I figured it'd be interesting to see if there's any difference in long-term durability. The paint in the other shop has held up well over the last nine years, and there are just a few areas that are worn where my joint would roll. That's really about it. Cost-wise, the solvent-based paint is about half the price. Both are sold as kits for about $100, but the water-based one mixes to one gallon versus the solvent-based one, which mixes to two gallons. In both cases, I bought two kits. Now one thing that I was not ready for was the off-gassing with this solvent-based paint. It was incredibly strong. I, of course, didn't think about that and bring my respirator from the other house. Luckily, though, I could apply the paint with the doors open. The air temp was below the application temp of the paint, around 35 degrees Fahrenheit, but since the floor is heated, the cold didn't affect the paint as it went down or as it cured. And yes, when the floor is heated, working in socks is the only way to go.
After that first coat, it was looking pretty good, but it was looking a little splotchy. The next day, when it was dry enough to walk on, it was clearly very uneven in some places. I'm not sure if that's because it was previously sealed and pulled in more paint in different places or what, but it did have a bit over a gallon remaining, so I mixed that up and applied a second coat. Taking a look the next day, that made a big difference. The coverage is much more even. I masked off the areas where the doors land to create a crisp transition between inside and out. I can pull up that tape and this part is done. Total time here was about 6 hours between the prep and the paint and about $250 between the paint and the prep materials. A few weeks later my parents came to visit to see the new property and my dad helped me get started on the walls. He wouldn't describe himself as a good mutter, I personally would, but he has much more experience than me. He got me started off in the right direction by adding the next coat of mud. While he was working on the seams, I went around and took care of all the screw holes. Thank you. Time to sit down. Come on, my hard work. Yeah, sit down, take a rest. Now I'll get started on feathering things out. Thanks for getting things this far for me, Dad. Now I'll be the first to admit that I'm not very good at this. <laughs> this is my third time working with mud, and my previous two experiences led to some pretty laughable results. This shop, although nowhere near as perfect, ended up being worlds better than anything I had previously done. There's tons of videos on YouTube about mudding and I've watched a lot of them, but I'm pretty sure that this is like most things. Watching a bunch of videos is great, but it's not until you get out there and put the time into practice that you actually start to get good at something. I welcome this opportunity to work on a skill that I don't currently have in an area of minimal consequences. After all, this is just a shop and will someday be just a garage again, so if it's not perfect, it's not a big deal. There are many seams in this shop, which made my progression very obvious to me. By the time I worked through a coat and went back and looked at the first seams I did, I could clearly see a difference in the quality of the work. It's quite fun to be able to see such a visible improvement in your work as you go. I got a few coats of mud on and then I moved to start sanding. My friend Donovan lent me his drywalling tools and his Festool drywall sander made pretty quick work of evening everything out. As I went, I marked any areas that would need further touch up with a marker. I found the sander worked really well on the walls, but I found it a bit awkward to use on the ceilings. For whatever reason, I found it difficult to keep the pad flat to the surface, causing the edge of the pad to dig and create divots. I ended up just giving the ceilings a quick sanding with a sander and then finishing them up by hand. Speaking of by hand, I worked all the inside corners with a foam sanding block to crisp them up because I like my corners nice and crisp. <laughs> Through all the sanding, I wasn't really concerned with the dust, so 
since I'm in a garage which is easily contained and easily cleaned up. If I was in the house, it would be quite different. Donovan also lent me his skinning knives. These have a stiffener backing a thinner knife which makes them feather really well and pretty much effortlessly. I used these to touch up the areas I had previously noted while sanding and went over some of the seams with them. I found the 24 inch knife great for blending areas where multiple seams intersected. If I really wanted to do this right, I would have gone over every seam with these knives to further feather them out. But at this point, it was close enough and I was ready to move on. Welcome to good enough territory. <laughs> now, I'm still not amazing at this, but what's most interesting is I now have a much better eye for quality drywalling work. I walk around my house and I see all kinds of issues that I did not notice before. So maybe this experience ruined me because I can only see those flaws around the house now. But what I find the most amusing is that my okay job out here in the shop makes this the best finished room in the house. <laughs> I feel pretty good about knowing I did a better job than whoever did the drywall work in the rest of the house. So totals for this step, about $50 of mud and probably about 30 hours of time between myself and my dad. This is a uh, very labor heavy step for sure. Now that I'm done, I can blow all the dust out of here. Normally I'd do this with a leaf blower, but that's at the other house. So I made do with my shop vac in blower mode. It's worked okay, but not nearly as quick as with a leaf blower. Also, if you're going to blow a bunch of drywall dust out your garage doors, make sure your wife's car is parked right in front of the doors. <laughs> I plugged my air filter in and let it pull the remaining airborne dust out of the air overnight and then I can get to painting in the morning. Okay, I'm calling that uh, good enough. <laughs> so at this point, I can start uh, putting stuff away, get this thing cleared out, and start uh, masking things off. There are a lot of seams in here. I figured the best way to mask off the garage doors was to just hang some plastic in front of them. This will leave me with a little bit of touch of work around the doors that I can take care of later with a brush. To mask the rails, I just covered them in paper. And now to deal with those rail supports, I just removed them. Since I won't be opening the doors while painting and I'll just paint the piece attached to the ceiling, I can just take off the connecting piece and leave the part in the ceiling attached. Now I can roll some plastic onto the floor and then it's on to primer. My friend Sam lent me his airless sprayer, and according to him, it's a real time saver. This I can confirm after having used it. <laughs> there was a bit of a setup process to get going and get the sprayer primed. Luckily, he also gave me the instruction card, and this might be more of an experiment of how well you can follow directions. And yes, I had this pail of paint shaken at the counter. Anyways, I got the sprayer primed and did some sample sprays to dial in the pressure to get a consistent spray pattern. Now one thing I didn't really think about was the sprayer blowing the drop clouds around. That's not something I have to worry about when rolling. So in areas where the plastic wasn't taped completely down, I have a nice spray of white paint on the floor along the wall. Oh well, it's just a shop. <laughs> but in all reality, most of these spots will be covered and never seen because they'll have some stuff on top of them. And I actually had also thought about installing baseboards to clean up the transition between the walls and the floor. I decided that was a silly idea for the same reason. You're probably never going to see a transition area because there's going to be stuff right there. I'll tell you what, your mind goes to some interesting places when you spend hours in a room with a mud knife.
this is how far I got with the five gallon pail of PVA primer. I had a couple of one gallon cans of regular primer that I dumped into the pail to finish up the rest of the walls and ceilings on the last bay. I did notice some fuzzy areas probably from sanding the paper. I sanded the walls quickly by hand to remove this texture effect. I like the walls to be nice and smooth to hopefully prevent dust from sticking to it as easily. After all that climbing up and down the ladder, I was at the store and saw they had extensions for the sprayer. I bought one, got home, and realized that I don't have any wrenches here to install it. <laughs> oh well. I'll get a little more exercise moving a ladder around and stepping up and down as I apply the top coat. I went with an ultra white with satin sheen. Yes, I like a bright, sterile looking workspace. I used the entire five gallon pail of paint and coverage was pretty good, but I decided to go out and buy a second five gallon pail and do a second coat to even out the coverage. While at the store, I bought a new adjustable wrench so I could install the extension I previously bought. If someone tells you that having two homes is great, they're probably lying to you and trying to offload their second home onto you. I'm looking forward to having all my stuff in one place again. Anyway, the extension made spraying so much easier and saved a good amount of time too. The previous coats took about an hour and a half and this last coat was under an hour. All right, let's take a look and see how things look after a second coat. Not bad. That's looking pretty good. It's uh, already a quite a bit brighter in here now that the walls are painted, which is super nice. Maybe. Still a little dark for this camera. <laughs> so uh, I think at this point, I can take all this uh, plastic down pull off the paper from the garage rails, uncover the garage doors, and do my little bit of finished painting around the doors, and painting will be done. I used four gallons of paint on that last coat, which left me with some paint to do around the doors. This was pretty quick to finish up, and since the paint dries so quickly, by the time I got to the end, I can go back to the beginning and add a second coat. Total for the step, seven gallons of primer, it's about $100. Two five gallon pails of the top coat, $150 a pail, or $300. And one extension and wrench for about 50 bucks, and total about eight hours of work. It's looking pretty nice in here now. So that takes care of all the paint. Floor is painted, walls are painted, ceiling is painted. 20 gallons of paint later, <laughs> this is what we got. Next, I'm gonna get into the lights because uh, this place is super dark and that has been the hardest thing for me so far, just being able to see what I'm doing. So back in my other shop, I bought uh, a bunch of these lights to supplement the existing lights which I had in the shop previously. So I'm starting out with a 12 pack of these eight foot long fixtures. I'm going with these for uh, the biggest reason is ease of installation. They just have a couple of clips that attach them to the ceiling and uh, then they're also linkable. So it's also really easy to install. So those should go up really quickly. Again, I'm starting out with a couple of 12 packs. So 24 of these. I have, I think, another 12 or 15 or 16 of them in the, uh, the other shop, which I will steal and move over here uh, eventually, but at least these first 12 should get me started. 
The color rendering on these lights seems pretty good, at least the ones I've had in my other shop for all these years or for the last three years or so has uh, have been working out really nicely. These are a white balance of 6000K, so a daylight balance, uh, which is what I like, I like a nice bright, natural, outdoorsy looking light. And um, with these, these are rated for 72 watts. So on a typical 15 amp circuit, you could do 1800 watts, which means I can do 25 of these fixtures on one circuit. In the other shop, I set up the left and right bays as separate circuits. So I have two switches for lights because I thought, you know, maybe someday I just want to have the lights on the left side on and the lights on the right side off. Yeah, I never ended up doing that, but what it allowed me to do is have enough power there for enough lights. So uh, if I do put more lights in here, I only need to have them on their own circuit or another circuit independent of the current one, which is in here for the current lights. I didn't order enough wires for all these lights because it wasn't sure on the layout I was gonna go with just yet, but I'll get these put up so they're out of the way and so I can at least turn a few of them on. I'm very much looking forward to being able to see it's a little bit better out here. To make spacing the lights consistent, I made a spacer to evenly divide out the bay of the garage. So a little bit of math, the total length divided by the number of items plus one, and that'll give you an even spacing for each of those items. I can take that number and I can cut a piece of cardboard to that length and use it to space each light from each other and the first one from the wall. So that's 12 lights up and onto the next bay. This is when I decide that I don't really need a door opener because I have arms. <laughs> but seriously, my old shop doesn't have any openers and it's not like I need to open the doors remotely from like a car as I'm pulling in the driveway or something. A couple of bolts and a pin to remove it and I can throw this opener assembly into the barn. It'll be a really quick reinstall when the space is converted back into a garage. I was thinking of replacing the opener in the first bay, which is the one that's still up there with a wall mount unit. But at this point, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to remove it as well because again, I have perfectly good arms. <laughs> I got the other 12 pack hung up in the first bay and I have a bunch of clips left over. So I installed those in the ceiling of the second bay so that I'm all ready to go once I pulled the other lights out of the old shop. And since filming this, I did get enough linking wires for one bay and it's looking like 12 per bay isn't going to be quite enough for me so we'll circle back to the lighting in a future episode. So that's where I'm going to leave this one. I still have to hook up the rest of the lights and bring the other ones over here but uh, the next thing I'll be doing is moving over all of the large machines which uh, we'll be doing right uh, right now which should be a fun adventure. I'm really looking forward to having everything here because the one thing that's getting super annoying is just not having my tools here. So it's going to be nice to have my stuff here. If I need it, I can use them and all that. As far as electrical goes, because I'm sure people have questions about that, that's going to give me, having the stuff here is going to give me the opportunity to make sure I have things where they're all going to go before I run outlets to everything. Everything is going to be, or most things are going to stay kind of the same. The general flow of the shop is going to stay the same, but because I have more width to deal with. I'm going to spread things out a little bit so I have more aisle room because I'm really looking forward to having more than just a two foot aisle around things. It's going to make it a lot easier to move around the shop with the camera and myself and my materials. So that's going to be super nice. So next time we'll get into the uh, machinery moving day which will be uh, a lot of fun. So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the new shop, anything back at the old shop I guess, <laughs> feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy working.